Hello and welcome. I'm Robbie. And I'm Jay. And you're joining us for episode nine of Generations Apart, the podcast where we chat about gaming and technology across the generations, sharing our perspectives on the past and our excitement for the future. On today's episode, we're discussing gaming on Mac computers, chatting through a bit of the history and what impact the latest Apple Silicon has on gaming today. Okay, before we get into it though, Jay, what's piqued your interest this week? Well, it's another been another massive week in GPT land, and I have to say, Microsoft have won it this week with the launch or announcement, sorry, of Copilot. So if you haven't seen it, which I know you have, Robbie, there's no <laughs> way that a man in your position wouldn't have seen this trailer. But um, for those who've not seen it, uh, and you need to go and check it out, this has got to be the future of how we do sort of desktop PC operations. I just, it changes everything. Um, so for those who don't know, very brief backstory, and we'll cover this in more detail in a planned future episode, but Microsoft have effectively announced the integration of the OpenAI GPT um, solution, ChatGPT, or it's, it's equivalent for Microsoft's purposes as your co-pilot throughout the Microsoft Office suite. So you're going to be able to use that generative AI technology across all of your work streams, whether you're in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and even in Teams. I think we talked about this weeks ago, back on episode two, I think, Robbie. Yeah. When we talked about generative AI, the potential for this to sort of be integrated with Microsoft Teams to do uh, auto minutes and actions, for example, off the back of your meeting doesn't sound very exciting, but it's a huge time saver. And I'll be honest, when we talked about that back in January, I didn't for a minute think we'd be sat here in March discussing uh, that very launch. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm so excited my voice is going. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, I know you were showing a video now for those watching along on YouTube, and you can, you can pick this up from the links below. <clears throat> but um, what blew me away was the ability uh, in PowerPoint specifically, as someone who used to create an awful lot, or still does create an awful lot of PowerPoint presentations for my role, being able to point Copilot at a Word document, a business case or a proposal, and say, create me a 10-slide presentation. And at least as far as the video is concerned, I mean, you know, how much creativity has gone into the edit, we'll, we'll have to find out when it launches. But Copilot will then go off and create you a, a for start of a 10, draft 10-slide presentation. I think that's mind-blowing. It Excel, is incredible. It shows, you, it shows you analyzing numbers just by pointing at a range and asking it to perform some analytics, and off it goes. And, and, and performs analytics, it just looks absolutely brilliant. Um, a huge time saver. It's going to be one of those things that I think in a year's time we'll all be talking about how do we ever live without it. It looks that good. Yeah. Might be exaggerating. I might be getting carried away here because I'm super enthusiastic. But <laughs> for me, what piqued my interest this week has to be Microsoft Copilot. It's amazing how quickly it's happened as well. You say back in January when we initially talked about it, we were talking about hypothetical situations and it's just moved so quickly since then. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that the Microsoft suite adopting it uh, just brings it into the day-to-day -day life of everyone else, which will, I mean, it's going to be used by everyone. And as you say, uh, people won't be able to live without it once they've tried it. It's interesting to see how this again will impact things like students. And um, I know some companies are banning the use of it internally as well. So it'd be interesting how they tackle this, given that a lot of companies are Microsoft houses. They use a lot of Microsoft applications. I mean, we, we don't yet know. Turn it off. Well, yeah, well, we don't yet know what tier of Microsoft license you require in order to get access. So it will be interesting to see where it falls from a pricing perspective. I think it's short-sighted to be banning these things. I get it with, you know, with chat GPT because there's so many unknowns. But if you're implementing, you know, and utilizing Microsoft's Copilot, there will be a whole load of assurances that need to be put around that by Microsoft in order to make that safe for enterprise. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a safer bet. I also think ChatGPT is far safer when you're using it on content that you've created to yeah. perform analytics or to perform operations. So in the example I gave going from Word to PowerPoint, it's your data, it's your information. Yeah. ChatGPT is just interpreting it and producing you a PowerPoint off the back of it. So... 
I'm not sure that that's as big a problem, but yeah, I, I, I mean, we'll get into this, but I don't want to go too crazy because there's a whole episode's worth of, of discussion here, multiple probably, that we could have done between um, between sort of the first time we talked about this and now. Um, but let's save that for the future. But um, super excited. Let's see in a few weeks' time when we come to record our future planned generative AI revisit, whether or not uh, Microsoft have announced pricing and maybe we'll know more. Perhaps we'll already be using it, Robbie. It's all moving so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? Uh, and I think that's where we're going to see it. All, all this stuff is more integrated in existing stuff that we're already using. I use a note-taking application. Uh, you're well aware of it, Jay. We use it for our for our um, note-taking for the podcast, a, a, an application called Notion. And they've recently, for their premium users, have integrated ChatGPT to generate text and summarize notes and things like that as well. There's lots you can do in there. And I just think we're going to start to see it everywhere. And to be honest, more people, most people won't even realize that they're using it. I think we'll get to that point fairly quickly as we start seeing it surface in different applications. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm super keen to talk to you about it and I really want to get into the topic, but I know, um, I know I it's know, not we'll today's topic. We'll so I'm going to back off and back off my enthusiasm. But yeah, really exciting. What piqued your interest, Robbie? So this week, I mean, it's a generative AI storm at the moment. There's lots going on. So there's one thing in particular that um, blew my mind this week. Uh, with the new development of ChatGPT4 being released, uh, which okay. I think was last week, actually. And one of the use cases that was demoed when it was released, um, and I do have a video for that for um, anyone who's checking out the show notes. I'll include the video there, but also who are watching on YouTube. And it's a video of they take a photo of a napkin, and on this napkin or, or piece of paper that the demonstrator brings up, He's sketched out a loose outline of what a website could look like. He takes a photo on his phone and he uploads it to the PC and sends it to ChatGPT4 and asks it to create a website for you with this photo. And it actually produces all the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript there and then for a very basic website in a similar design to this incredibly loose sketch that this guy's written out in a notepad. You know, I should say for those watching or not watching along and listening on audio, it's a literal pencil sketch. It's not, there's no color, there's no nope. fanciness here. It's a literal outline drawn in pencil in a notepad. That's astonishing. Yeah. Um, so that's the one of the latest developments with GPT-4 <clears throat> is now you can upload images and it can understand things about those images. I saw another example, which was a, a ball on a piece of string hovering over a, a, a kind of balance board. And if you ask it what happens if you cut the string, ChatGPT knows that it'll fall on the balance board and flip up the other object on the other side. Like it, it can figure that out just by looking at the image. So it's got kind of logic now built into it in how it analyzes images. Um, and you can see on the on the video, if you're watching, a an output of the code that was um, created by ChatGPT in relation to that, to that image and the actual website. He puts it in a kind of a code playground sandbox and you can see on the bottom there, it's kind of just uh, a little bit outlined, but a joke website has been created based on that sketch. Um, absolutely incredible. Blew my mind. <laughs> um, it's scary, isn't it? It's it, And I know that we're, again, not, not for this episode in detail, but I know the more I hear about this and the more people who assure me that this isn't going to result in the rise of the robots... <laughs> <laughs> the more I think they're wrong, <laughs> yeah. the more I think this is, you know, we're, we're weeks away from Skynet, but um, all yeah. jokes aside, it's, it is super exciting. I think uh, I, I I can't wait to see and, and reflect on these episodes with you, Robbie, here, uh, come Christmas this year and to see how much of our lives have changed as a result of this in just 12 months. Because as you say, if we were to cast our mind back to episode two, when we first started talking about this, we, uh, we, we were talking about a Google rival and within weeks it was out. Microsoft were talked about bringing it to their browsers. It's already in, mm. um, you know, it's moving so much faster than I can remember any other technological advancement. Um, at least in my memory, I, I just think it's mad. Um, yeah. but in a really exciting way for techies and a slightly scary way, if you're, you know, if you're the pessimistic type, you could be reflecting on this and thinking, is it too fast? Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, by Christmas, that if you think two to three months from when we last spoke about it, by Christmas, rise of Skynet would have already happened by then. Octoberish last year, that it really blew up in the media. Yeah, true. So you know, we're less than six months from the point at which this became 
you know, of mainstream interest. Mm. And it's taken over our lives. I mean, yeah. literally any other technological advancement has been pushed to one side. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, in October was the Meta Connect event. And I remember it because I attended it in, in VR. We talked about it in episode one. Um, that was pitching the, the metaverse as the future. Now no one is talking about the metaverse. No. And Meta have just laid off another 10,000 people from their, their team. I mean, I know they're not the only ones. There's a lot of people making these kind of changes. It's not because of chat GPT that Meta have laid people off. And, but it's, it's, it's interesting how quickly the conversation has turned mm. from blockchain, NFT, VR, the metaverse, to now chat GPT, yeah. AI. It's back. Um, AI is back in the headlines, you know, full on. Hardcore. It uh, doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. So, well, I'm no we, doubt we'll we be did talking say about that this again. about all the other topics. So maybe come Christmas, it'll be old news, and something new will come along to to take it out of the news. You it's, never know. This is uh, I, again. I know that we're <laughs> we need to get onto the topic of the show, but this is just so different to <laughs> any other kind of technology. Like when NFTs blew up, it was for all the wrong reasons. You know, it was it was the board ape yacht club and all that kind of stuff, and you know, they were, it was it wasn't sort of a an exciting or or particularly scary advancement. It was one of those, huh? <laughs> why? You know, like whereas this has got people either super excited or really really worried. Yeah. Um, and it's racing away. Um, and like I said, you know, the advancements and the speed at which it's making its way into our everyday lives is pretty is pretty scary. But also, you know, for a technologist like you and I, it's super exciting. So. Absolutely. Let's see where it goes. Absolutely. Right. Well, moving swiftly on to the topic of today then. We're chatting about gaming on MacBooks. And firstly, I just wanted to go into why we chose this as a topic, or rather why I chose this as a topic. So I I've never owned a MacBook computer. Um, I've never had a desire to, uh, I think, in the past, just because I'm so used to Windows PCs and I'm used to... Um, the the ecosystem that you get with that, the, the software, the um, Microsoft suite for, you know, Office and things like that. It's all just so natural with the, the Windows and the way I've used it before. But more and more recently, especially with the release of Apple Silicon, so Apple has started to develop their own hardware for their laptops and, and all their other computing devices. And the power that these chips are getting, because it's so well integrated into the rest of the system and the software and everything... Uh, it, it, they are looking absolutely incredible. And it, they are, for example, flagships when it comes to um, creative production. So things like music, uh, photo and video editing. I don't do a lot of photo and video editing, although I might pick it up if I end up getting one. Um, but I do a lot of music production and they are fantastic for music production. I've got lots of friends who are trying to convince me to get a MacBook for, the, for music production, um, but also coding as well. Uh, and coding, I used to code mobile applications and for anyone who does that you might know that mac os lockdown uh, developing uh, ios applications you have to do it on a macbook you can't do it on windows machines um so i was kind of limited to only developing android apps back in the day so there's lots of other reasons why i, I might be interested in a mac but the one thing that is holding me back is that i game quite a lot on my computer and so I wanted to bring it up as a bit of a talking point today is gaming on Mac has always not been a fantastic experience, but more and more recently, because the hardware is there, they have amazing graphical performance, but perhaps maybe the software isn't there yet. The developers aren't making games for it. So that, that's the topic for today. Um, and I thought we'd kick off with, I know you have a MacBook uh, with the latest Apple Cynic, well, not the latest, I think it's the M1 Pro, right? That you have. Yeah. So I was going to ask if you have had any experience gaming on on that machine yet. No. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. That's a great so, talking point. You can tell no, we didn't prepare so, um, that question beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I haven't, um, because I am spoiled for choice when it comes to where to game. So, you know, just, just for those listening, I, I have a Windows PC. That is what I stream with. Um, I have uh, he bought it almost for that purpose, and and it was pre it was built to be an editing machine. Um, although I prefer editing on my Mac, uh, just because I train myself on Final Cut Pro and and tools like that. So migrating to an entirely different video recording product is um, is not really practical, um, or not really something that my brain wants to accept. It wants to keep going back to how I did things in Final Cut, and I found that transition very difficult. Um, so I have a PC, desktop PC. 
I have a, an iPad Pro, which at the time of buying the iPad Pro, it was when I sold my previous MacBook mm. and decided to move away from the Mac OS. Deeply regretted it. Um, so I'm very grateful to be back in that ecosystem. I enjoy my Windows PC, but I have to admit, for all the reasons we've we've talked about with Apple before, that single ecosystem, how everything is just neatly integrated together and works, just, I don't know, it just draws me back in every time. I don't have the frustrations I have with the PC. Even now, even with a high-end machine, it's not particularly powerful from a graphics perspective. I have a middle-of-the-road graphics card. But everything else about the machine is 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 high spec and it's designed to be quick and efficient. Mm. It's just not the same experience as the Mac. Um, I also have all the latest consoles that because I'm into gaming. I'm, I'm the, probably the bigger gamer of the two, in in that Definitely. respect. Um, <laughs> so you know the, there just hasn't been a need or or any compelling application that I couldn't put on anything else and play it better. Which is, I guess, to your point, that has made me say I must install this on my MacBook. Yeah. Um, just a quick sort of potted history of my Mac ownership, if you like, because I have played games on Mac before. Oh, yeah? Just not on the new one. So my reason for pivoting to Mac back in, I would guess it would be around 2010, 2011, mm. um, was sheer frustration with my then desktop PC, which I used to use for some photo editing and just light browsing at home and stuff like that. It wasn't anything big. It wasn't a fancy rig. It was one of those sort of typical kind of office pre-built sort of low power desktops that's all it was yeah and um i'd done some photo editing the night before i turned it off went to bed like i did every night got up the next morning turned it on and the whole operating system had completely gone to shit excuse my French. <laughs> and i had to rebuild the whole thing from the ground up and i just got so frustrated because my my job my day job then was as a, a service desk analyst so i was fixing other people's pc problems all day i didn't want to come home and fix my own and it it was the final straw with me. Um, I'd got an iPhone at that point. I just, I think, ordered the second generation iPad. So it was kind of moving into the Apple ecosystem, being coerced in. It's and um, I, was into, I was into photography. Um, and I'd just started a college course. And they use Macs at, at the college. So I was like, that's it. I'm going to get an iMac. So I had one of the nice iMacs, you know, big uh, screen. Very nice. 27 inch iMacs back in the day. And I loved that machine. Really did love it. Used it all the time until uh, for work, I then got a MacBook Pro, maybe three or four years later, um, which just was that bit quicker and that bit better in terms of performance that it made the iMac redundant. So yeah. it was perfectly usable um, and had plenty of life left in it, but I, but I got rid of it because I didn't need to. And instead, I invested the money I spent on that into some nice displays um, and, a, and a decent dock, and I kind of created a home setup for the MacBook. Uh, and that was in my device for many, many, many years, a number of years until, um, until I was trying to get into streaming and it, it was quite old at that point. Um, and even though it had been top end when I bought it, it just didn't have the, the oomph to deal with the processing power and the graphical requirements of streaming. Yeah. Um, and I sort of slowly over time had been upgrading my streaming setup and this MacBook had become the, the barrier that was preventing me from moving it forward. Mm. Um, so that's why I got rid of it. And, and in that Fair time, enough. didn't play a lot of games, I'll be honest. Um, maybe, I mean, again, I'm a console gamer uh, for, for sort of primarily, so I tended to play Football Manager, I think, was a Mac. Was There was a Mac version of for, a, for yeah. a brief period. A handful of those kind of real-time strategy games, um, sort of point and click. Yeah. Anything with a mouse that, that kind of needed a mouse, I would play. Um, and everything else I would play somewhere else. So my gaming time on Macs is, is quite limited, to be honest. Yeah, um, but I know you've got a few things you want to talk about, which I I can talk to in terms of you know, how you might play games on these devices. Yeah, but in terms of the traditional sense, not really something I did a lot of. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Well, interesting. You've got a bit of you definitely got the background in Apple PCs that we can talk about today, which I I don't have, so it's good to get that um that kind of perspective. Uh, blending the two worlds of an Apple enthusiast and a gamer, a PC gamer. Um, so I thought I'd touch on the history on, I'm by no means an expert on it, but in my research, I found a few interesting things on the history of Mac gaming. And as you might expect, it's Macs aren't really known for gaming. So a lot of the developers didn't make native games for MacBooks. So in the old days, when it was Intel Macs, when the, the CPUs weren't made by, uh, by, by Apple, there were certain programs that you could use on there, um, that would 
allow you to dual boot Windows on your MacBook, for example, where you could play non-native um, games. So you could play Windows games on uh, on your Apple Mac. And that, for a long time, because my, my wife and I have a few friends who did that quite a lot and played a lot of games, that was their main kind of gaming uh, PC for a long time. Because even with just the Intel and not the uh, the new M silicon, the, the Apple uh, silicon, they were still quite powerful and you could get some good kind of graphics performance out of it. I do remember an article because so I, I used to do that. So I used to have, I used to have my Mac. It's called uh, boot camp. Camps. Well, I used to do two different things. So right. um, because I used it for work and we didn't support apples at my previous employer, um, they put a VM of one of our work machines on, yeah. um, on my MacBook using, I think it was like VMware fusion. Mm -hmm. So I used to be, I used to run the Mac operating system on two displays and then I'd run my virtual uh, work laptop on a third display, and that's <laughs> nice. how I used to work. So I'd, I'd have all my access to my sort of core work systems on one screen, and then all the things I needed on the Mac on the others. Yeah, it was great, really good setup. Um, but I did boot camp as well uh, on both the iMac and the MacBook um, at various points. There was an article at the time that said the best way to run Windows, or the best win the best laptop for Windows, was a boot camp Mac at one point <laughs> because it ran it the most efficiently. That's so definitely really written funny. by a, an uh, Apple enthusiast. <laughs> I, mean, I know it really wasn't. It was, it was something like Gizmodo or something at the time. They might well have been an Apple enthusiast, but they'd done, they'd done like benchmarking. It wasn't just someone going, oh, oh I right. think this is a good experience. They, they genuinely benchmarked it. And the Apple at that time from the device they'd chosen had come up better um, <laughs> at running Windows than the, the, the laptops that were obviously designed for it. Um, but again, I'll be honest, I didn't really do a lot of gaming in those environments. Yeah. It wasn't really the motivation for doing it. The motivation was the streaming desires at the time, or it was for work purposes. Um, and, and you know, I've never been a PC gamer. We've talked about this before. Yeah. You know, back in the day as a kid, I played Worms and stuff like that on PC. <laughs> I, I gamed on a PC, but I don't think what you'd class that I do on PCs as PC gaming. Yeah. I've always been sort of envious of the graphical capabilities, but frustrated by the, the, the inconsistencies and the challenges and the install problems and the... Just the sort of things that you don't get with the console, which is it's one of these things though. Once you once you do it, you get a bit spoiled. So kind of lower refresh screens really are really jarring for me now, which is an absolute first world problem for sure. Um, <laughs> but I do find if I'm playing like a normal console game, I can really tell the difference now between between PC and and others just on that point. But you also brought up um, an interesting point there about the virtual machine, which is the the other way that people used to game on MacBooks as well. So the three main ways you would game on MacBooks back in the day on the Intel chips were the uh, native, if, the, if there were many games through, say, Steam. Uh, Steam is available on, on MacBooks, um, but there aren't many native supported games. Then there's Boot Camp, which is just, uh, you know, you, you restart your PC um, but load Windows. So the actual whole PC is, is running Windows. And then there's the virtual machines, which is you have an application op open up in Mac and uh, sorry opened in Mac OS, which is a a representation of Windows. And in terms of the performance, Boot Camp was the best, uh, as you've said with um, running Windows. It was amazing at doing that, but also it was fantastic for actually running the Windows native games as well. Uh, the virtual machine was not the best. You always suffered a bit in terms of performance. In fact, you actually I mean, toggled manually the performance often for these virtual machines, and it was limited yeah, by what... You'd have to decide how much resource to give over. Yeah. That's it. And, I because mean, it had I to run both. Mac it Pro. ran macOS yeah. and the, the Windows OS. It PCs, effectively. Yeah. Um, and, and all of your hardware had to be sort of swapped one back and forth between the two machines if you mm. wanted to use your CD drive. God, you're back at what was a CD drive back in the day? <laughs> um, then you know you'd have to tell the virtual uh, the virtual machine you're now using the disk drive, and then it obviously meant that the Mac couldn't use it, and you'd have to mess. It was I mean, it wasn't difficult, but um, you wouldn't game on that. It's not a gaming setup yeah. because, as you say, uh, you're having to give over enough system resource to run the virtual machine. So you're sort of putting one arm behind your back on the Mac, and then you're doing the same on the PC. So it's not really an optimal way. To, to to run a game on a PC. It we'll hold more... that thought for when we get to uh, what we're able to do now. <laughs> okay, well, um, I don't know what we're able to do now because I've okay. not explored gaming on a Mac. Um, and I'm assuming boot camping is either not doable or significantly more challenging now that we don't have the Intel chips because obviously it's all custom custom hardware, isn't it? So 
but you know you understand this far better than i do obviously so. <laughs> well so yeah that brings us to apple silicon launched now um their own hardware so it the challenge is that windows can only run on uh it currently can only run on hardware that it's already designed for which is like intel chips and there's the there's a whole architecture uh, thing in the background that it needs to work with um i can't remember the numbers but um apple silicon is an entirely different architecture and so it can't it can't be ran on the same hardware you can't run windows on the same hardware so boot camp out the gate when they launched uh, the new apple silicon doesn't work on on macbooks and similarly a lot of older uh, uh a lot of applications that used to work on the intel max had to be remade and revamped to work with uh, the apple silicon as well so it's not just windows as an operating system that can't run on mac os even today there's still a lot of applications that can't run on uh, apple silicon uh, and, and is still waiting there's like a backlog of lots of these really popular apps that are waiting to be ported over to the new versions um you've got you've got to imagine if they've not been done yet they're probably not getting done yeah or, i mean like what it's been it's not like this is a, a new new thing is it now we're on what second generation yeah second generation two, was it two hardware generations on the m1 is that right i'm not it was the m1 yes. and the m1 pro and then the m two is it now yes it is yeah and well so the so, m2 was already out and they've just released the m2 pro and and uh, max and ultra all yeah. the names <laughs> um but yeah m2's been out for a while i think as well because the latest ipad in fact has the m2 chip it's a whole separate yeah it does yeah a whole separate chat but um yeah so they, they've brought out the i guess the later generations of the m2 which is the pro and the max that was uh, out fairly recently yeah so I agree. I think a lot of the applications that aren't going to be haven't been ported over yet might not be. But I know there's huge communities for some of the some of the software that needs needs to be ported over. Something that cropped up the other day is there's some uh, music recording or music plugin software that you can get that they don't have Apple uh, native silicon support, um, and that's on their backlog. They actually sent out an apology email to their customers recently saying that we're working on it. It's the next thing in our sprint cycle. So. Uh, for things like that, it should be released soon, but there's still lots of companies, quite big companies, who are still working on the stuff um, to, to port it over. Well, I think I told you, uh, it's, just, it's not to do with silicon, but um, there was a an incident back when I was on, on this MacBook for work purposes. The reason I had the MacBook is I was using Adobe Captivate, which at the time I think was only a Mac product um, mm. or, or worked best on Mac, or it was my excuse for getting them to buy me a Mac. I can't remember. <laughs> but um, the... Uh, they, the, basically, the, I think Mac were moving to a new operating system, which was going to remove, um, I'm going to get this wrong now and say something like JavaScript or something, but it was getting rid of some sort of technology in the back end that meant that a bit similar to this this situation, a whole load of apps needed to be kind of reconfigured and, and recoded to some degree in order to make sure that they still yeah. worked on, I think it was uh, I think it was Lion OS when they moved to Lion. And um, effectively... Adobe had tested uh, all of their core products, you know, that you might think of the Photoshop's, the InDesigns, the Captur, because a huge, huge audience on the Mac for those products, which we'll, we'll kind of come on to. But for some reason, Captivate, which was an e-learning development tool, was just completely left untested. Mm. Um, and when everyone migrated over, which at the time was it was very difficult to go back on a Mac to an old version of the OS. Yeah, it wasn't an easy thing to do. So once you'd moved over. Um, it was very hard to go back and it was not easy for me at all because of the situation with it being a sort of work machine. Um, I was left without Captivate for about three months while Adobe patched the product to make it work on the latest operating system. Yeah. So for three months, and I was quite lucky that it wasn't an essential part of my day-to-day -day role, but for many who, for whom it was, there was uproar in the forums yeah. that a company as large as Adobe um, and as sort of, you know, with such a key audience on the Mac, it's not like a, a niche game that no one plays on the Mac everyone plays on pc these are tools that are used all the time and in, in some cases predominantly yeah by apple users just completely not not tested not functioning and, and broken for three months it was incredible yeah um, there's a wider point there i think about like the developers who are developing applications for for apple software i do think it's more difficult to do on apple just because there's more machines you can test it on there's more it's more widely available um windows as a software to to kind of use um, and I think Apple also have a, a bit of a bad habit of choosing companies and developers to give early access so their their software is working from day one. 
and there's obviously a, a, a whole group of developers or the rest of the world mm. in fact that that don't get that access so they have to work is basically as soon as um it's available on on beta or, or to the rest of the world as developers rather yeah. than um being on I the think you give them Adobe a pass there though because in that environment they had it and they did it for every other tool <laughs> in their suite except for Captivate yeah. so yeah. I don't know and the other thing just just to slightly count at that point though one of the things that I've always that people have always said to me uh, and this is part of the reason why I've always enjoyed the Apple ecosystem is that Apple developed their tools for their hardware and and therefore it's a controlled ecosystem there are only so many laptops so many chips so many pieces of hardware that can possibly be in an Apple device that it's much easier air quotes True. for them to ensure everything works as it should do whereas microsoft have to develop an operating system that can work with god knows what piece of hardware that might be put into a pc by a random buyer from a random you know from a random um vendor so windows has to be that much more capable and flexible and in some ways is arguably a more impressive operating system because of it mm. whereas apple do some fantastic things in terms of the ecosystem of Mac OS and, and, and the OS um, on your iPad and your iPhone, but they've got a much narrower set of hardware to have to design for. Yeah. So in some ways it makes their lives easier. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, but also that's, it's kind of barriers for, or, or really tight guidelines and guardrails for other developers, not just Apple. Apple obviously are going to be very familiar with their own systems and their own OS and how everything works, but for, for developers to create software for it where there is really specific, um, specifications that they need to meet to develop applications for it it's tough for i think third-party developers but a apple native apps and, and things that they develop for themselves like i know for the music side the logic logic pros you know fantastic app um oh final I mean, cut I've, i must admit final I, I bought cut, yeah. final cut oh god i bought vinyl cut in it would have been 2015 2016 mm. earlier than that no in fact it would have had to have been could have been as early as 2013 mm. 2012 and i haven't bought it since and i still get all the updates it's still final cut 10 or x or you want to class it as and i get all the updates it's still it's still relevant today yeah what 10 years on yeah which is mad so they are very good for that like once you if you buy these native tools that you do get like you know you're not rinsed every couple of years for a brand new version you know you're in and you're on the upgrade path and they keep you in there and they could have potentially tried to rinse me and others two or three times in a 10-year period for you know the latest version yeah um, and i know other products vendors do those yeah. are the tools on my work machine for for on windows where the versions changed several times just in the last six or seven years so yeah and in this kind of vein of developers third-party developers in, in the gaming space apple obviously don't make their own games although maybe that's something they'll go into um other than you know for for ios and uh, other devices that are handheld not actual like gaming uh, uh, computers so they need to incentivize developers to create applications to create games for their machines and in fact when they released one of the i think it was the m1 pro and the m1 max when they came out with the the macbooks they announced a uh development or partnership with uh, resident evil uh village was one of the first games that was developed with that hardware in mind so that's one of the first games that became properly native to the m1 pro and the m1 max at the time and apparently runs really well i've seen reviews online but that is by no means uh, a common thing to happen <laughs> to have developers port really popular AAA titles to uh, mac pcs and it's it's going to need convincing from both apple as they're going to need lots of incentives basically for for developers to to create games uh, native to to m1 uh an m2 silicon um and i think that that is the challenge it's the same challenge with the applications the developers um have very tight guardrails to work in and um less opportunity to to for for a wider audience as well do you think they care though well they cared enough to bring it up on stage when they announced it and in their recent they did but another announcement recently where I, I, don't, I know that there's been a lot of long rumors that apple wants to get into the console business um, and that they're prepping a console, but that's never really happened either. They've just slowly turned the Apple TV into a home console. Yeah. Because the Apple TV, again, has a selection of games available. You can, on all iOS devices now, you can connect your PlayStation or Xbox controllers natively. That's all supported. 
Um, I don't know whether they're necessarily that bothered about gaming in the way that we're talking about it, because again, you've got to define what you mean by gaming. Apple are arguably one of the biggest gaming companies in the world in terms of providing devices that play games. Yeah. They're just not the games that you're talking about. They're yeah. not hardcore battlefield, you know, Apex. Well, I think they do play Apex, but you know, they're, oh, they're not. I'm, yeah, I'm sold. Sure, I'm pretty sure Apex is, well, there's an Apex mobile, isn't there? Oh, there is, that, yeah. I don't know if there's Apex on Mac. But I guess my point is, I think they're, I, don't, I just wonder whether Apple are interested in a different market. Uh, do, do they, do they expect to be able to pull in that hardcore PC gamer? Because the biggest problem I think that they've got with that is not so much the software's ability to run the games. It's the inability for the gamer to be able to get in a mess. Mm. But one of the biggest appeals to, I assume to you as a PC gamer is the fact that you can upgrade your hardware you can mess with settings, you can dial it right up to 100, you know, you can get the latest graphics card, push that in and push those graphics, ray tracing and everything right to that sort of intense level and you'll stick more RAM in and you'll, you know, do you know what I mean? You're, you're kind of on that upgrading mission to mm. build a gaming rig, you know, in air quotes, whereas Mac don't allow that. Like Mac, Apple's devices cannot be messed with in that way. You can't take your iMac apart. You can't take your MacBook apart. Even the Pro machines now, they're limited as to what you can get in an upgrade. Um, yeah. I mean, there was a point where you used to be able to upgrade your IMAX and um, there was a small panel on the back. You could upgrade your RAM. That was literally it. Yeah. Um, but without taking the whole thing apart. Um, and same with MacBooks. But even that ability has been taken away now and they're sealed units. Like you can't get in to do that. And if you can't, if you can't upgrade it and you can't change the guts and, and, you, and all that good stuff, then you're not a million miles off a console. And for the money you're spending on a Mac... You could, if you've got the money to buy a MacBook, you've probably got the money to buy one of the gaming consoles. I, I feel like the PC market is, PC gaming audience has got a different requirement, perhaps. I think the, the counterpoint to that is because uh, we're not just talking about gaming like PCs, like desktop PCs, there's gaming laptops as well. And that's a huge market, gaming laptops. And they have a similar restrictions in that they're not very upgradable neither. And one of the other things that I used to have a gaming MacBook, I used to have a, an Asus um, gaming machine. I can't remember what it was called, but it was really, really powerful. I ran everything on it. Um, but the battery life was probably two to three hours um, max. And when you're gaming, it's one hour. So I think it, the appeal, I think, is more that it's an all-in-one. Because you don't... I think PC gaming is not just about uh, you know, a super powerful gaming machine. It's all the other stuff it does as well, right? It's an all-in-one. You can do loads of different things with it, but you can also game. And I think that's what I that's what I'm personally interested in with a with an Apple MacBook. Uh, if it could game or have more um, native game support, is that you can do all this other stuff, all the things I mentioned before, like music develop, uh, music production, and um, coding, and and all the other things. But also at games, and it can do AAA titles because it has the graphical performance just sat there. Uh, ready to run these this stuff that theoretically there's nothing stopping it from a hardware level to run these games it's more uh, the developers have not created the games for it um, so it for me it's it's the all-in-one package not the fact that it's upgradable but it's the fact that you can take your 20 hour battery <laughs> macbook with you all day to run whatever you want on it and you can also game on it wherever you want as well I don't think you get the battery life that you're sort of romanticizing over. Well, I think that's if you what's in their marketing. That on a MacBook, it's <laughs> going to quickly deplete the battery in the yes. same way a, a hardcore gaming laptop must do as well. I don't think Mac Apple's have got and Apple have got a particular secret that that other manufacturers don't know about when it comes to battery technology. Um, the, well, it's the efficiency of games. It's going to zap it. True, true. And running hardware, uh, hardcore games, I think, will have a bigger impact on the on the battery. But it's the fact that you could go 10 hours not gaming and just using your MacBook to do whatever and then still have enough juice to do, like, two ga two hours of gaming um, after that as well. Like, it's, it's more than... Because I think with the gaming laptop, I'm talking two to three hours no matter what you were doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's because the hardware was running all the time. It's the issue with not integrated hardware is that everything is still turned on all the time but 
with Apple Silicon, they focused a lot on things like efficiency cores in their in their CPU, um, and they'll have lots of other components that allows for energy efficiency. They have cracked a bit of a secret when it comes to the battery. It's not that the batteries are bigger or anything. It's just that the machines are so efficient, and you're only using um, the powerful components when you absolutely need it. And they've got lots of other things to to run everything else when you don't. And that's why these the lasting like all day uh, MacBooks, which for me, um, for something that you could use all day and still game on it, is just it's mind blowing. And I think that's that's the thing that really attracts me to it. But there's obviously limitations, which I'll come on to in a second. <laughs> Um, I'm still not convinced that the audience overlap. Enough of them. I think you're a unique, or slightly niche audience. That, that their marketing would beg to differ. Because you know, there's, there's not a, there's no near enough RGB lights in a MacBook to appeal to a real gamer. Um, <laughs> That's true. And if you were looking at my rig right now, light up and, and go rainbow colors, it's it, not. It does look like a unicorn's throw up on my. <laughs> On my computer, sorry. No, that's true. And it's more subtle. But I, th I think that there is a market for it. And, and they know that as well because you can see it in their marketing. Whenever they talk about graphical performance, their graph that they bring up is always a gaming laptop. And it has it in the, in the bottom. It tells you like a gaming laptop com um, computer that it's comparing the graphical performance against. And then it says, oh, yeah, we also have like 10 times more battery as well as um, being able to run these games. So there's they know in their marketing, they must have done the R&D to figure out the market research what? to figure out that there is a market for that so just as there is a market for for gaming Mac, uh, gaming laptops anyway yeah undoubtedly Let, let's flip it then if it's if this demand is so high because we know that macbooks are far more popular now or macs in general are far more popular mm. now than they've ever been before in terms of desirability and sort of people who are buying them you know, they, they used to be back in, you know, pre-iPhone days, a, a sort of a niche tool. Most people didn't use them mm. uh, outside of a particular community because they didn't really play nice with anything. Now everyone's got iPhones and iPads. Loads of people have got Macs. Why are developers not putting more support or effort into developing their games to work on Mac? Because we know that some do. You, know, you, you mentioned Resident Evil as a great example of, of one that received good reviews for performing as well as it did on the Mac. What do you think is stopping these big developers from trying to get a piece of that market? Because it feels like that's untapped potential. It's not like we're talking about, you know, uh, a, a niche piece of hardware that only a few people own. This is, you know, it's got great sell through, hasn't it? There's a lots of Macs out there. And as yeah. you say, they, they seem to run, they seem to be good for much longer than a normal Windows machine would until, you know, before it starts to creak and, and show the need for upgrades. Mac mm. seems to run for that bit longer. What do you think the barrier is? I think it's Apple need to support it more. I, I think the, the example of the Resident Evil, you can tell that they obviously paid them a lot of money to port that over as their flagship, kind of we're going to show off this game as the main thing that now makes Mac gaming um, a much more viable uh, thing. And I think they were probably hoping that that would have a domino effect on other developers to start doing it. But from what I understand of it, it's still really not easy to port games over to Apple Silicon. Um, and it is difficult to, for, for developers to do that. And it's difficult for them to justify the cost when there is no, because Apple's yeah. are still not super known for gaming, there will be a market there. It's just that it's unknown really what that market is. So there's no real guarantee that all these developers who port the games over are going to get their money back from the resources they spent on actually porting the game over in the first place. That's what I'm saying, though. If there's, if there's all these Macs out there, but we're saying there's a question mark over the appetite of the owners to buy the games in the first place, then then are people who are buying Macs, like me, looking to game on their MacBook? Or are you an unusual character and a, a bit of a niche animal in your own right? Like, do, does, Are there enough of you out there that want that, that want to hardcore game on the move? I don't know. And, and I guess the challenge is when you talk about game development... Um, I know there are differences between PCs and consoles, but they're closer now than they've ever been before mm. in terms of their hardware, aren't they? The Xbox, the PlayStation 5 are both running on what is basically PC hardware. Yeah. Um, even the Switch, very easy to develop for by all accounts, and, and that's why there's so many indie titles. Yeah. Um, and it's become the indie the indie darling. Um, I guess, like you said, because the Mac is an entirely different hardware solution, when I can develop a game on PC, Xbox, PlayStation, and Switch with relatively little between them, I know that's 
I'm oversimplifying because I don't understand the, diff the, the, the challenge. Mm. But then I've got this kind of obscure device over here that I've got to almost rebuild my thing from the ground up potentially or completely rework to, to work on this. I guess that, like you said, that appeal just isn't there. But what can Apple realistically do to make that easier? Is there? Are we thinking like some sort of sort of SDK, you know, some sort of toolkit where they they simplify the process of porting on behalf of the developers and make that that journey easier? Um, you know, is that what Apple need to do? Yeah, that's what that's kind of what I was thinking. Is that on the on the software level, if there's anything they can support them to make the the porting easier, like an SDK, as you say, um, I think that would be a huge thing if they made that easy for developers to port existing games over um to the point where it becomes a no-brainer why wouldn't you because it, it is a market regardless even if it's a small chunk of the macbook owners um there's there will be gamers among them or people who never really considered gaming on macs but now it's available and now it's freely available and it's it's they're now known for gaming it becomes more uh more uh appealing to to those who are macbook owners i think it does need both the software support to port them over, as well as probably some kind of financial incentive as well. I don't know if there's a way to do that. Maybe. Um... But I guess the question then is: Is that worth it for Apple? Yeah. If that's not their, if that's not their primary audience, it, why spend millions of pounds and and then develop this SDK of several million pounds again when you're selling as well as you are already? It's not like I don't think they're missing out on a particularly big audience that would that would. Apart from yourself, who's you're saying is held back by the fact that you can't do absolutely everything on your MacBook, you know you've got a Steam Deck, you greedy pig. What else do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you've got you've got a piece of a big PC gaming rig as well. Like you, you know, I suppose it's whether you need it, isn't it? The, the other thing I was going to say was, and and maybe this is an alternate look at maybe idea where Apple are gambling. Do you think they're looking at the streaming market and saying, well, if that works on our browsers? Mm really need native game support because you know in in the long run at least casual casual gamers which is really what i guess a lot of mac users might end up being can hop on their xcloud account and just stream a game on their browser you know and, and you know i know that that doesn't work absolutely everywhere you are but you think about the moves we're seeing from the likes of um spacex you know and, and all the satellites they keep pumping into the sky to provide satellite broadband Home broadband speeds are going up all the time. The technology is getting better and better all the time with streaming. I know you're not a fan because yeah. you like refresh rate and you don't like the lag, and I get that. But for your casuals, for like 90% of people that aren't as um, as sort of attuned to those technical challenges as you are, I wonder whether they're thinking, well, that would probably be enough. Like most gamers on an iPhone, when they're looking at their app store or, or probably downloading relatively casual games compared to what you might be thinking of as a as a triple a title do you think they'd be content enough with you know an x cloud experience on the move and then they get home and they boot the console up or they boot their big fat pc up and they yeah. play it yeah you know, the, the 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 real way i wonder if they're gambling on that a bit because you can do some of that already to a degree so x cloud i'm 95 percent sure works on my macbook although i've not tried it i think you can do it through the web i'm not sure if they have an app well, they, they don't have do. a native app no because yeah. there's an argument with apple over that one so there's no app they do have a PS5 remote play. Do they? Um, yeah, which I works re which I gotta say works pretty well actually. I did it um only within my home, I should point out. I didn't try yeah. it on the internet on, on the go. That I imagine that experience is not as good. But I was able to sit in the living room and stream from my PS5 and use my PS4 controller, uh, Bluetooth to my Mac to comfortably play Spider Man, I think it was, I was testing out, which is a relatively fast moving game yeah i'll be honest you wouldn't have liked it because it wasn't sort of yeah. as buttery smooth from a frame rate perspective but again like for a i'm playing on my macbook on the sofa it was good enough you know yeah. it, if i wanted the full experience then i would have gone downstairs and played it properly or you know waited to get somewhere i could set up a proper proper connection um yeah so there, there is some of that already you rightly pointed out the the other way to game on which i failed to mention before which is the the streaming and there are you know, a few services that you've mentioned there. It's still not quite there yet, at least for me, or that, I mean, there probably is for the, the casual gamers that that's absolutely fine. Um, but Ooh. I think... Oh, Robbie. What? Casual gamers. Yeah. We're get, are we getting into that camp, are we? You just <laughs> said that. You just said casual <laughs> gamers. Those I'm who are not like... I'm not throwing rocks. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Those who are not going to notice, I guess. Um, 
as I said, very first world problem. But uh, <laughs> I think that I think it's more about it's not it's not more about whether there's a market there because there clearly is for those who are buying gaming laptops. And I think that's the opportunity that they're looking at more than anything because what is the sell compared to the the top top of the line gaming laptop? Um, the only difference in well. There's obviously a lot of benefits to getting a MacBook. You get the battery life. You get a lot of other um, power that you wouldn't necessarily get with with gaming laptops. They last longer. Um, there's tons of benefits. It's kind of on the table almost for them to to steal a big chunk of that market for those who can who can switch over to Mac OS without any issues, which is you know might be a big ask for some, but for, there will be a part of that well, market that won't care. I was going to say that because if we wind ourselves back to January before you yourself started your slow crawl towards the dark side <laughs> and switch from android to iphone and and switch your watch to your new apple watch you know there there was a time when you you know you were anti-apple in that respect not like you know i'm not calling it it wasn't like apple wars kind of you know but you, you your your argument was the flexibility that you could do anything you wanted with your samsung mm. your android device whereas apple made that harder because they can take they controlled the ecosystem there's possibly a similar argument for sort of hardcore PC gamers that might still want the flexibility um, that the Windows OS provides on their gaming laptop rather than the sort of more walled garden that the Mac might offer. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I can absolutely, I mean, I love my MacBook. Yeah. I love it. And if it could play hardcore games, great. Probably wouldn't use it. <laughs> yeah. But it'd be nice. It would be good. Um, and there are some decent games on the on the game store on, on the on the um, Apple Store. They're a bit dated. They tend to be several years behind. Um, as you mentioned, Steam's library is much more limited. Uh, mm. So you know it it is restrictive. But i um, I've never I guess I've never sat there and looked at it and thought, God, I wish you played Red Dead Redemption Two or mm. you know, which I know that's not really is that a hardcore game anymore. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard I mean, to it's, run. It's I think. pretty power intensive, but it's an old game. It's a previous generation at this point. Isn't well, it? it's like um, GTA Five is an old game, but it's also yeah. still quite challenging to run. <laughs> Just keeps going. Yeah, that's because yeah. they keep upgrading it. Though I don't think Red Dead's had. Has Red Dead Two Redemption Two had a Series X and PS Five facelift? Mm, I'm not sure. Couldn't tell. I don't know. They had. You know, I definitely got a 4K facelift when they brought out the. Um, the pro and the blanking on this what was it called the xbox one x one x yeah um they definitely they definitely did a 4k facelift i don't know if it ever had i i'm just expecting them to do that because it's what they did with gta it, it might GTA already be done. rockstar yeah it might already be done but they're not giving well this is completely off tangent they're not giving that game the love are they by all accounts from the community that gta is still getting i think everyone was expecting and hoping for much more in the Red Dead Redemption 2 online experience because of the way they've supported GTA. But I guess it's, again, I've got to assume it's a more niche audience that wants to ride around on horseback in the Wild West. I think it's great. Looks visually <laughs> impressive. I only played about an hour and a half and got bored because it was too slow for me, Yeah, to be honest. And the amount, and it's, you know, the amount of games I've got that I don't play that could happily join the list. But um, I guess it's not quite as frantic and as fun as racing cars around a city and shooting people, is it? Which um, GTA 5 obviously True. offers you. True. Um, but yeah. We went slightly off topic there, but <laughs> just bringing well, it back to... Um, still gaming. Still Thanks. gaming. It is still gaming. Um, bringing it back to gaming then. So we're, we're chatting a lot about native games on Mac, and I think the reason there's more of an emphasis on that is because you can't run boot camp. Um, but there are alternatives, as you said. There's streaming. And then there's there's a, a company called... Uh, actually, it might not be a company, but a product called Parallels, which is a virtual machine software specifically aimed for gaming on um on macbooks so it creates a windows virtual machine and you can run windows uh gaming on there windows games through like steam and other libraries um it's supposed to is be that, a bit is that done from like a server though i mean it's obviously not running the windows operating system it's natively, native is it? so it's on the mac yeah so it's it's uh it's a virtual machine yeah so it's running windows in oh. a virtual machine as far as i know god you got me thinking now <laughs> well, I'm only questioning because we said earlier that when they changed their own silicon, that that wasn't possible. It's not so... possible to do it native on the hardware, but that pa this is why um, Parallels has become quite a popular software um, thing because it's it's translation software basically. So it's an application that no, no, no. translates the Windows architecture 
to uh, to whatever it's running this application through. So you can do virtual machines. You can't say reboot the whole system into Windows. That's still not possible, which yeah, is what Boot Camp but did. But I guess parallels... that was the challenge you mentioned earlier, wasn't it? Though that that yeah. means you're not really harnessing the full power True. of the Mac in that environment. So you're you're going to have a lesser experience than your comparable hardware on a gaming laptop, I suppose. It's true. Um, I've never true. heard of Parallels. Yeah, it's quite a popular one. They released a new version of it recently, which is apparently even more optimized uh, for, for gaming and, and running Windows. So it's it's getting there in terms of the, the support from um, third-party uh, like translation software like this. There's still no sign of boot camp, and I think there's talk of it not actually being possible, um, and that's partly because Windows... Um, so it's it's ARM architecture, ARM silicon. I think is is what's talked about in the, in the in the news. Um, that needs to be able to to um, Windows need to be able to run on ARM architecture, and I don't think they they've cracked that yet, uh, or Windows hasn't um got a version of of Windows that can run on ARM, and that's why Boot Camp doesn't run, as far as I know. And um, that was when I last looked it up. But um, Parallels is the closest you can get for native running Windows and Windows uh, games as well. So it talks about it being lightning fast, and there is uh, entire Wikipedias and blogs about the best performing games that you can run through Windows, through Parallels on Mac. Um, so it's- Interestingly, it, this is it doesn't the, seem to show that on their website though. No, it doesn't seem to be geared not, towards gaming. It's not how they're like promoting it. it, is it? No, no, that's a good point. Um, but again, yeah. probably because it's not the optimal way to do it, Just, just, just because you, I guess you just because you can do it doesn't mean they want to call it out yeah. as their sort of unique selling point, I suppose. But um, that's interesting. I, I, I still, I'm, I still think that Apple are more interested in their uh, Mac OS, in the um, iPad and iPhone OS as a gaming platform. Yeah, and I think that their App Store does so well for them, and of course Apple Arcade, you know, is their kind of gaming on the go kind of uh, subscription solution which is i have to say as a parent with um two children who've got uh, apple devices i am much more in favor of the apple arcade than i ever cared when it was just me yeah uh, i very rarely use it but i will tell you that the app store is absolutely full of predatory apps that are full with of, of advertisements and attempts to get you know get you to buy coins or roll for loot boxes um, there's a handful of games that my daughter's really into that are I, they're unplayable as far as I'm concerned. She tolerates it. She's not bothered in the slightest. It's just the norm to her. But literally every few minutes, every few interactions, it's like a full screen ad that you have to sit and watch for 20 seconds mm. and you can't get rid of. And and then you go back into the game and it's advertising. You normally advertising another junk game which then <laughs> yeah. she comes and asks me if she can download. Whereas the, the beauty of the arcade is that everything in there is advert free. Yeah. Um and and obviously free to play to whatever level you want to play it. So I'm much more I'm much more encouraging of those games, although she seems to prefer the ones that come with all the ads. Um and they're just trash. But it's it just it saddens me in a way that that is the gaming experience and the norm that they are accepting of. Because <laughs> yeah. The tolerant the tolerant of it, the um the adverts. I, you know I, what makes me laugh, though? I, I often wonder because they I, I pay for YouTube premium. Um, which is the best thing I ever did. Uh, whenever I try YouTube on someone else's device, when an advert pops up, I'm always completely like, oh, what is this? You know, <laughs> my God, this is so frustrating. You know, you um, hate mine. <laughs> so they benefit from that because their their kids aren't their kids' accounts are on my YouTube Premium account, so they get the the best of that ad ad free world. But I wonder if they'd be as tolerant as if their Netflix series or their Disney Plus series kept shoving an advert up every thirty seconds because mm. it's that level. It's some of these games. It's that frequent. Yeah. Um, so it does. It you know I do I do wonder whether uh, the sort of more casual gaming on the App Store has got a bit out of control from that perspective. And I guess it's part of the reason why Apple decided to introduce the Apple Arcade so that there's that kind of protected area they can promote best practice, but then they can also leave all of the uh, developers who are enjoying mining the kids for adverts. You know. Um, yeah, really I suppose the store. the flip side of that is that there's there's no real incentive for Apple to crack down on these. Um, you know, harassment adverts that you get every twenty seconds. If they've got their own uh, Apple Arcade, I suppose that is their answer to it. But uh, it'll cost you a bit of a premium. <laughs> uh, well, again, we, we I, mean, I know I'm talking from a position of sort of um, benefit in some respects, but we, we've got the Apple One 
premium things. Everyone in their in their families on Apple devices, and they all get the benefits of that subscription. But yeah, that's how they get you. I, I, <laughs> I also think as well. I mean, I was being quite tight on my kids' devices in terms of restrictions, so I always wondered if I'd be that parent, and then I became that parent, and I locked everything down. Um, but if I hadn't, then you know, God knows what that device would be filled with and what she'd be seeing and clicking on. There's things that I that she does now in it that I'm uncomfortable with. Mm. I just think, you know what, I've got to just suck it up. You know, this is just one of those things that uh, you know, it's not my world, it's their world and whatever else. But you know, I, I at least can control the number of apps that she's downloading and the things that she routes through to and just pulls off the app store. Yeah. Um, because I I I lock that away. But uh, I do wonder what the hell she'd be would be filling her device if it didn't have those kind of parental controls in place. So yeah. Yeah. And maybe you're right because they do have Apple Arcade, obviously on the TV, as you've mentioned before. Apple TV, maybe that is where they're they're aiming for. Is Apple Arcade? I don't have a MacBook, so is is Apple Arcade on MacBook, Mac OS? Very good question. I have not looked. Um, <laughs> I would assume it must be. Yeah, uh, but I've not I've not gone into the App Store. I would go and get it now and look, but it means leaving the camera and leaving the <laughs> mic and <laughs> leaving some dead air. But. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's a really good question. Like I said, I've, I don't really use the App Store on the Mac um, because for most of the things I want, it's they're not in the Mac Store. Yeah. Um, I download most of the apps I need from the websites of the, the providers of the solutions. Yeah. And I use I use that device for, I use it regularly, but I use it for very specific things. So I, I don't, I'm not regularly browsing and I don't game on it like, you, like we said earlier. Yeah. Um, it's primarily an editing machine for me. Uh, I use it for some of my social media stuff. I don't really use it for for that kind of um, that sort of just casual browsing. Um, in fact, ironically, I'd probably use my iPad for more of that sort of stuff. So True. the iPad's where I'll go seeking apps out and, and I look for the unique apps because the one thing that does still appeal to me about my Mac, uh, sorry, my uh, iPad over the Mac is that the iPad has got much more... Um, better priced let's say and, re- and and more available solutions that are still leveraging the m1 chip so things like if i want to do some 3d rendering yeah then there's a relatively low price tool for the ipad that i can download the touch screen the pencil which is a nicer experience um whereas if i want the what i would class as a true laptop experience and i know this is again first world problems i'm spoiled in a way I hop over to the MacBook and I do something laptopy, and then I go back to the tablet when I want a more tablet. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm very lucky to have the two experiences. Um, so I, I don't use any of these devices extensively enough to be able to say, you know, that any one of them is is the what the single device killer that will can be your absolutely everything. Yeah, it was my aim with the iPad Pro, um, and then it just hasn't really landed. Um, it's better now than it ever has been, but now that I've got the MacBook, it kind of negates the need for the for the, the iPad's increased flexibility. I will say that when it's um, now docked onto monitors and you're using Stage Manager, it's a much better experience. It's really good. Multi-screens mm. work really well. Um, but again, gaming-wise, I use my iPad sparingly. Um, I, I tend to use it more for the native iPad games. Yeah. So again, sort of the lower quality, lower fidelity kind of. I like the tower defense games, things like that. Yeah, I'm a simple man. Um, <laughs> I have hooked up console uh, controllers to it before. I will say the PlayStation controller was easier, but yeah. then it was a pain because you had to keep going back and forward and resyncing it to other devices or have multiple con- um, controllers. They tried to be clever with the Xbox controller because I don't know if you know about this. The Xbox has, um, so I think the PS5 uses it's just Bluetooth. Yeah box standard bluetooth xbox uses its own proprietary wireless technology to connect to xbox devices it's why the headset marketplace is much sparser for xbox oh i didn't know that um so an xbox headset so my xbox headset can connect to the xbox and a pc by using the xbox native wireless um and then the bluetooth so you get uh, two connections okay. the, con- the controllers do the same so the controllers the newest ones have the ability to be linked to an xbox but also paired to um like another device Mm. in this example like an ipad the problem with it is it works but it's not um it's not particularly user-friendly or logical easy to remember method by which you have to turn the controller on to get it to connect to the thing you wanted to go to so by default the xbox button for example wakes your xbox yeah press it in a certain way it'll connect to your ipad but it and it it just that experience it was clever, but it was not user-friendly. What I would have liked was two separate buttons. 
Yeah. So almost like, you know, let me like turn the Xbox on with this one, but connect with something else. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like cloud gaming on all these devices works. Yeah. Um, Maybe that's the way to go. And because, as you say, internet connect connectivity and speed and ping is getting much better. Maybe that is the future of it. Um. I, I I just I'm in hope for native games in future. That's all I'm I'm hoping for. And to be honest, in their marketing, it does it seem like they're they are keen on it. I mean, the fact that they've got a 120 hertz screen as well, so you can you can get high refresh, um, refresh rate games on there, um, that actually make use of the screen. I don't know. A lot of a lot of signs are pointing towards that they are hoping that gaming will take off on the MacBook, and so am I. <laughs> That's absolutely fair, and and I promise that if it ever does, um, and there's a game that's worth playing there over any of the other choices that I'm fortunate enough to have, I'll give it a try. Yes, um, but I I will for research but I, but for science for research for research <laughs> for the podcast probably. But um, you know I don't know it's it's just not something that's ever crossed my mind. As I said, I've tried it in the past, dabbled. Um, I've reached that point now, and this is maybe an age thing, so I know we're not reflective of the audience you're talking about them aiming for. But I just can't be bothered with messing around anymore. If it's not simple and sort of smooth as, as a process, I haven't got the time to problem solve or um, yeah. you know change that driver, switch that component. I just I want to turn it on and maximise that bit of free time that I've got. So if they can make if they can make it work that seamlessly, like most other, to be fair to Apple, most other Apple software experiences do. Mm. Um, I find very few times do I sit there losing my temper with my Mac versus you know pcs over the years um that's I think possible I'm, I'm for it. possible oh, the benefit is that the apple way of gaming triple a titles on there would probably be like a console you just literally switch it on and it would work um because yeah, which, there aren't that which, many options in terms of hardware and software and all that so which would be appealing and like i said the one thing that i've um i always harp back to as a um, as a gamer and, and with a nostalgia in mind is those point and click rts games where you absolutely need a mouse i know that you know things like give you an example of one that's that's cross platform there's something like halo wars now i didn't really play that one extensively but i'm giving you an example you can play that on an xbox you can use your xbox controller mm. and you can you painfully move the mouse with your analog stick and it takes forever and you know it's just not a nice experience or you can play it on your pc and you can use your keyboard and mouse and you know you can you can have a much more um a sort of faster and more engaging experience um i do enjoy that and i must admit that's the one that those are the only times where i think pc yeah or, or back in the day it would have been theme park i guess these days it's whatever re- version of roller coaster tycoon we're yeah. now on or whatever <laughs> the latest is but you know those kind of uh those maker games um you know jurassic i think it was like a jurassic world one recently that really tempted me the problem with those is that the time investment is so great that i just can't can't craft enough time to sit and enjoy them as much as as, as much as I would like to. Yeah. But those are the sort of gaming experiences I could see myself having uh, on the move. Yeah. I'm Fair not enough. really bothered about, you know, first person shooters or full on, you know, uh, triple A adventures, but but you know, some good top down kind of strategy games I could see myself enjoying. Fair enough. Fair enough. I take the point. Um yeah, and I think that is the the gateway for a lot of people to use. Uh, PC over console is is those those games are designed mostly for keyboard and mouse. Um, we're coming up on time, but I wanted to quickly bring up something that I thought was really interesting for anyone who is looking for a MacBook um, and was considering what games it supports, or currently has a MacBook and is wondering what games it supports. There is a Wikipedia page called um, I'll include the link in the show notes. It's AppleGamingWiki.com. And there is, it's a big database of all the games that. that are supported. Does it does exactly what it says on the tin, that, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. Um, and it actually shows you the different platforms as well. So Parallels is listed on here. It tells you which games run really well through the virtual machine um, and which one's not so good and how many are native games and, and how well they run as well. There's a kind of a rating from perfect playable runs to unplayable. Um, I, I can't read what you've got on screen there, but I notice there's a handful that don't have anything so one, if you scroll slightly yep. further up, there's one that doesn't have anything against it. What is, what is that doing on the list? And and what I assume this is not an exclusive list for all games on PC that work on a Mac. This is solely those that do work on a Mac, and where you have to play them. Is that right? That's correct, as far as I know. Um, 
I, I didn't make the website. <laughs> All I can say is I thought no, it was I, I'm just asking what, it, what what the list looks like. So yeah, uh, certainly appears that way, doesn't it? So applegamingwiki.com. And what's the, what kind of games have you got on there that are native? Give, give me some examples that, that might be impressive or is it that bad that there aren't any? I mean, there's, there's an awful um, lot there. At, well, so some of these are there. mobile games, I think, um, yeah. as well. Because I think you can run <laughs> iOS games on there, so it's bringing that in. Diablo, I've seen, is on the list here. Uh, Doom, Diablo 1. Doom 3, which uh, don't That's starve old. together. Um, me and my wife play that sometimes. Um, farming Simulator so Diablo 2022. Diablo 1 and Doom 3, which are neither which are particularly new versions of their own franchises, are they? No, so definitely on the AAA side, there's not a lot. Really light, yeah. Yeah. I don't even know if they make the Football Manager games for Mac anymore. They used to. For a short period, but I'm pretty sure that's gone PC only now. PS for anyone who's into emulation, PSSX2 looks like it runs uh, perfectly on there, so you could emulate PS2 games. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> really selling it here. Um, yeah. But it's an interesting database to have a look through. Should have come at the beginning of the podcast, right? Because it really proves your point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought yeah. it went without saying. I did say that there wasn't a lot of uh, native gaming support. I didn't realize it was that bad, though. To be honest, I mean, I know it's not the home of gaming but i didn't realize it was so sparse yeah um and in terms of anything modern i mean i know you haven't exhaustively gone through the list there but you've ke- you picked out the ones that jump out yep and uh and they're old let's be honest doom 3 is how old now at this point i can't even imagine that yeah it's gotta be gotta be 10 years old more yeah possibly angry birds reloaded though that's what we're after <laughs> Is that on there? Oh God! Yeah, that's yeah, what I mean. Okay. I think so. It runs iOS games as well, so it has included that in there. Uh, it looks like it's padded that out quite a bit, actually, with some of the, the iOS games. So just bear that in mind as well. But I do think right. there's a whole market there that the they're not taking advantage of. Um, I think you need to start uh, tweeting Apple, or um, I tell you what, I will be. I'm hoping to go to the Apple Cupertino headquarters as a part of my uh, 40th birthday trip to LA in just two weeks. I will go and talk to them. I'll find Tim, Mr. Cook. I'll say, excuse me. <laughs> Mr. Cook. <laughs> Robbie, my podcasting partner, has told me there is a compelling case for gaming on your platform. <laughs> sort it out. <laughs> so I want to hear at WWDC. Just for year. me. Just for yeah, me. Just for Robbie. No, I'm joking. No, it's, um, it's a good point. Like I said, interesting debate. Um, we, I guess part of the reason why we, we do this together is that we have differing opinions on this, <laughs> yeah. which is absolutely allowed, perfectly healthy. Um, we're not, uh, we're not encouraging these kind of anti-platform wars or anything like that. We, we love all tech and we'll have a go at it wherever it is. But I think it's interesting that we, we do have you know, differing opinions on this and it, it's worth exploring them. Yeah, absolutely. And with that touching sentiment, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Uh, so that's all for this episode. Thanks for hanging out with us. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and all good podcasting services so you don't miss an episode. You can also check us on Twitch uh, at, at Jay and Robbie, where we stream roughly three times a week playing a variety of games. And we'll see you next time. Thanks again. Bye.